So one of the biggest things we've, we've changed is our scrotal approach in the adult canine neuter. In the past, the scrotum was kind of considered sacred. You don't touch it, you don't shave it, you don't scrub it. If you do anything to it, the dog's going to traumatize it. Um, so we've decided people thought that they would self-mutilate. But if you look at all the other species that we neuter, the canine is the only species that we don't go through this scrotum. So scrotal hematomas, right? Horrible. We hate dealing with them. The owners hate dealing with them. These grapefruit scrotums often see with prescrotal approach. This dog's name was Bandit. The people um, let him run and jump and swim in their pond after surgery. This would not have happened if this had been left open to drain. So a few years ago, we did um, this study with Mississippi State University's College of Veterinary Medicine. And it was published about a year ago. And it's under, it's in our, on our website under the, some of the e-learning tabs. So our selection criteria were dogs that had to be greater than six months. Those with any obvious disease or cryptorchidism, no. Obvious trauma, infection, current process going on in the scrotum, no. So we found 437 dogs met the inclusion criteria. Oh, don't start judging the study by what we heard earlier, right? <laughs> Um, and dogs were randomly signed by a quarter coin toss uh, to either pre-scrotal or scrotal. The weight of dogs, both techniques were prepped the same way. Um, a closed castration was performed in both. And a post-operative assessment survey was completed. This was a multiple choice questionnaire that we sent home with the owners on multiple questions. So we asked them to assess the amount of post-op hemorrhage. Circle which one. Okay. We asked them to assess the, what they thought the swelling was. We asked them to assess how much pain they thought the dog was in, not taking into account the type of dog that it was. You know, the golden retriever that doesn't care about anything, the little dog that it thinks everything is terrible. And how much does the patient lick and chew at its site? And again, these were just po these were multiple choice questions. Circle which one you think, and they mailed it back in. So of the 437 dogs, hemorrhage was obviously more common with the scrotal technique because those are purposefully left open to drain. The pain was similar, both prescrotal and scrotal. But the self-trauma was significantly lower in the scrotal approach, which was completely different from what we'd always been told. 54 out of 437 dogs licked and chewed. 34 of them were pre-scrotal, 20 were scrotal. So the odds of self-trauma were almost twice more likely with pre-scrotal than with scrotal. There's also an article in the clinician's brief that just came out in May on the same topic. And we have a video that I hope I can get to play. This is our scrotal neuter video. This is also on our website as well as our YouTube channel. This is the scrotal neuter approach. Scrotal neuter. We perform dog castrations via a scrotal approach. Placement of the incision is at the most gravity dependent location on the scrotum. Imagine the lowest point if the dog were standing. A nick is made over this point and the testicle is grasped, forced against the scrotal skin, and the incision is extended. The testicle is exteriorized. The incision can be made as long as the width of the testicle and can be shifted to have either the cranial or caudal pole come out first. The testicle is then grasped in one hand and a blading technique is used to completely exteriorize it. We have found that sharp dissection tends to produce less post-op swelling. However, in younger dogs, blunt dissection can be fairly easily performed.
Once the fat and fascia are cleared from the cord, a clamp is used to create a crush. A modified Miller's knot is set up under the clamp and the clamp shifted to allow the knot to be placed in the crushed area. Typically, for dogs less than 40 pounds, one ligature is placed and an approximately two centimeter tissue tag is left above the ligature. For dogs greater than 40 pounds, two ligatures are placed and at least a one centimeter tissue tag is left above the ligature with approximately 0.5 centimeters between the two ligatures. The second testicle is exteriorized through the same skin incision, but we need to incise through the median raffe and spermatic fascia. As a side note, at Humane Alliance, we prefer to administer an intratesticular block of lidocaine during the surgical prep process. The same ligature process is performed on the second side. We use a splash block comprised of a combination of lidocaine and epinephrine just prior to closure. There are three approaches to closure with this technique. The first is not to close it at all, leaving the incision open as is done in many other species. The second is to glue the skin only. The third, which is what we prefer at Humane Alliance, is to place one buried subcutaneous right in the center of the incision. The goal for this placement is to allow for apposition of the skin edges while still leaving either end of the incision open to drain. The suture should place as an inverted simple interrupted with the knot buried in the subcutaneous. Contrary to traditional belief that dogs will self-mutilate if the approach is made through the scrotum, our experience proves this not to be the case. There appears to be no greater tendency toward self-trauma with this approach versus the traditional pre-scrotal approach. The scrotal approach is easier, faster, and has no greater incidence of complications. Owners or caretakers should be informed that it is normal to see a small amount of blood-tinged discharge for a few days immediately post-op. Okay, so a couple of changes that we've made from the protocol described in the article. Um, one is the blading to try to get the, to, to get the testicle out. One is the number of ligatures. So I believe that the study used one Miller's knot. We have gone to two on the larger dogs because we did have some bleeding on some of our training animals. And the third is the study describes closing the side, the median raffe, and the, and the other side. We decided to not include the median raffe in our closure, and we're finding a little better results from that. So, scroll deeper. Included what in there? So 
we think that this question was, what was the difference? Why did we change our closing technique? We changed it because we thought that maybe the median refe was holding it together too much, and we get a little better drainage by not closing the median refe. Monday through Thursday, all of our animals stay overnight and go home the next day. And so for the shelter, of dogs who are already at the shelter. The question was, is there an increase in infection rate for dogs at the shelter? And we have not seen that. We've been doing this approach for about five years. Were the dogs bleeding? How much blood is there? The question is, how much bleeding is there? We tell people to expect some small blood tinge discharge for up to three days. And that's written on our go home instructions. Um, on this study that we did in Mississippi State, half the dogs were done at Humane Alliance in North Carolina, half the dogs were done at Mississippi State. The ones at Mississippi State were shelter dogs. They went back to the shelters, and there was no in problems with increased infection rate in those. Yes? Have you tried at all having a closure for those concerns? We do scrotal, and we uh, use a glue. We use glue over the top. And um, we haven't seen any swelling or issue right. not having the drain. So the question was, can you glue the entire thing? And as we mentioned, there are three ways of closing. You can leave it open. You can glue the entire scrotum incision together. Or you can place that one, one simple interrupted suture in the middle, which is what we've chosen to do. There are three perfectly appropriate. The, the question was bandaging the scrotal of the scrotum afterwards. We call that a scrotal wrap. It's basically a pressure bandage with a little piece of bet wrap. Those are usually stay on for a few hours or they could or to several a few to several hours. Um, those are done if there's a excessive bleeding at the time of surgery, at the end of surgery. Usually just that little bit of pressure on there, no problem. We take it off and they're fine. Occasionally we'll use some ice packs. But with the lidocaine epinephrine block, that will solve a lot of those problems. Any other questions? Yes? How much lidocaine do you use? It's a one, point, one part lidocaine, nine parts lidocaine to one part epinephrine. Your pre-surgery block is intertesticular, mm -hmm. uh, in both testicles? In both testicles, it's a, it's a dosage by weight for the lidocaine, and then they half it, one half for each testicle. Um, it's a very specific injection method. We use a 25 gauge needle. We inject it over a very specific period of time. The needle is held in place for three seconds and then pulled out and then a finger held in place for three seconds to try to decrease scrotal hematomas before you even incise. So that injection is controlled swelling, not pain. The lidocaine injection, the intratesticular injection is just a local block. No, I'm saying it, we, we give the injection in a very prescribed manner to prevent scrotal hematomas from the injection. Okay, but does it, does it help with post-op pain? Yes. <laughs> That's the goal. Do, is, is there any studies? To, you know, we just had a talk on how to evaluate right. Dr. Bushby? <laughs> I don't think I've seen any studies that prove that it reduces post-op pain, but most of the anesthesiologists you talk to will say that it does. So the question for the, for the recording was the intertesticular block, what's the purpose of that? It's for another layer of analgesia. Remember, we're trying to get to multimodal analgesia. So it's for another layer of analgesia. Is there a study proven that it works? No, but it's something that the, anal the anesthesiologists recommend for us. Yes? For any animals that have had significant amounts of scrotal swelling or bleeding, mm -hmm. I know, you know, for Humane Alliance that you don't normally do any 40X testing, but do you ever go back in those animals to see if they have any platelet disorders from, you know, tick-associated diseases or not? We don't. You don't, okay. Um, we certainly call the owners to see if there's rodenticide because that's more common in our area. Okay. So the question was, is there, any, if, is there any further testing done if there's excessive bleeding? And we don't have anything like, we don't have excessive, we don't have a lot of diagnostics at Humane Alliance. So we don't, we, it, we inquire as to, to the owner as to if there's a rodenticide exposure possible, but that's as far as we go. In the back. Uh, the question was about the blading technique all the way around. 
it is, it's, it's literally look for where it's most tight and take the blade there. It's like a painting the blade all the way around the, te the testicle. Um, getting a little closer, getting a little sharper, being a little more aggressive at the area of the gubernaculum. So the next topic is taking care of our cells. Um, ergonomics is considered one of, is considering one of the big things and we need to take care of ourselves. If we don't take care of ourselves physically, we can't help the animals. So we need to take care of ourselves. Some, Dr. Sarah White did the study. Um, some of you may have participated in it. She did a study of 219 veterinarians and looked at where they hurt, how long they do surgery, how long they've been doing surgery, and how often they do surgery. And participant profiles were varied. I think the median was four years in spay neuter, which I thought interesting. Quite a range of experience and workload here. So how can we help ourselves? We're the surgeon. We can help our, our local environment. We can help our physical environment. We can also alter our techniques and our movements to be more efficient and to help ourselves. So look at this picture. Standing versus sitting, doesn't matter, but you can see that Dr. Marchitelli here is standing with an appropriate posture. The table height is at her elbow level. She's not bending over, she's not slumped, and her neck is bent. This is some um, data from Dr. White's survey. The, the body regions where the spay neuter veterinarians most commonly experience discomfort. You can see that low back, neck, and shoulders were most likely to be uncomfortable. Low back pain is pretty common in humans, so it was expected to find that. However, the rate of shoulder and neck pain and upper back was about 40% higher than what's surveys of other veterinarians. So the only surveys where we've seen these high rates of neck pains is human surgeons. This slide is showing the, the areas of discomfort in the hands. The right thumb and wrist are the most common, and I know that's mine. Can everyone relate to that? What contributed the most to total pain scores? When looking at the prevalence of pain, 99% of the vets had experienced some musculoskeletal discomfort in the past month, 98% had general body pain, and just over three quarters had hand or wrist pain. One of the big questions was workplace factors. The top predictors were hours per week in surgery and the number of years working in the field. Many studies in the field have shown that people who have a higher job stress level have a higher work-related pain incident. So in prevalence of pain, sorry, 98% um, experienced musculoskeletal discomfort, and about three quarters of them had hand pain. Previous surveys indicate it's about right for veterinarians. And the whole topic of sitting versus standing. 84% of the vets in the survey reported that they stand most of the time. Recent research is indicating that human surgeons found that sitting or alternating between sitting and standing alleviate a lot of the pain. And that's certainly something we recommend at Humane Alliance. If we can get the veterinarians coming to us for training, if we can get them to try sitting, they find that they like it. And then we, all, we recommend they alternate sit for one, stand for one, or some people like standing for dogs and sitting for cats. But you must adjust the table, the stool, and the animal accordingly to, uh, so to eliminate the musculoskeletal discomfort. So how can we help ourselves? One thing is table height. You can see on the left, table way too high. The surgeon is raising her elbows and her shoulders, putting a lot of strain on those. You can see on the, the table on the right, the surgeon is having to bend over, creating a lot of lower back pain and neck pain. Also, you can talk about patient positioning. The dog needs to be up, the dog or cat needs to be up at you. Some people have those V surgery tables. Sometimes those things kind of keep the dog away from you, so I tend to not like those. Um, you want that animal to be up next to you. Uh, sometimes your assistants will place the animal in the middle of the table because that looks, looks like the right place to put the, day, the animal. But you need, to you need to train them to keep that animal up to you. So what about this picture? What's wrong with this picture? How about that surgery, that instrument table? 
way too high. They're going to have a way too big an arm movement to try to reach for those instruments. Consider the use of friendly footwear. We all discuss about what shoes we wear. But also consider what mat you're standing on. You do need a mat underneath your table if you're standing. Consider the amount of support and softness. You need to have an equal amount. Some people find that resting a, a foot up on the platform of this, of this table or up on a stool helps. The bottom line is figure out what's best for you and do that. Posture. Recommend, Dr. White recommends videoing yourself in surgery and seeing what you're doing. Um, what's your posture like? What are your arm movements? What inefficient choices are you mistakenly making as far as twisting, reaching, bending, leaning? Make a choice on which side of the table to stand. And this is a hot topic, but <laughs> there's, there's the right side and there's the wrong side. Um, I stand on the dog's left. Dr. Bushby teaches his students to teach stand on the dog's left if they're right-handed. Or I think your specific thing is to place your dominant hand towards the dog's head. Um, most of us were taught to stand on the opposite side. And once you're used to a side, that's the side you have to stick with. But just keep in mind things that, little things that you can do to help yourself. So what can we learn from this? Each of these alone might be manageable, but together they're going to cause an additive effect on especially our hand and wrist. So if you look at this video, look how much Dr. Brestel's hand, wrist, and fingers are moving in doing this figure eight knot. Okay? There's a lot of motion there. Think about everything we go, our bodies go through. Using the thumb forceps in entering the body wall. To try, to, try to limit, try to decrease the amount of time that you're grasping something. Try to decrease the amount of force that you're using. Consider the suture stress. Consider suture size. The bigger the suture, the more stress you're having to put on it. Uh, the suture knot tying requires that the surgeon apply forces to the end of the suture equivalent to 80% of the suture's breaking strength. So if you consider a three-aught, which is three pounds of force, versus a size one that's nine pounds of force. So consider suture strength. Hand and arm strength is used to break down the testicle. That's why we really like the blading technique to break down the, the, the tunic, to break down the testicle. So using that helps to eliminate some of the stress that we're having to use on our upper on our arms. Um, the breaking the suspensory ligament. If you're finding a lot of hand or wrist discomfort and breaking the suspensory ligament, search for another way of doing it so that it's easier on you. Taking a pause, taking a micro pause for 20 seconds every 20 minutes. I like the neck rolls, nice big long neck rolls as you're reaching for an instrument or while you're, suture, while you're placing your suture in your needle. Take a nice shoulder roll back. Just do something, change positions, move. Do something in between every surgery or even during the surgery. And more suggestions can be found on Dr. White's website, ergovet.com. So the last topic is something that we don't like, but it's something we have to deal with. Um, Dr. White did a paper on fetal suffering during a very hysterectomy of pregnant animals. We don't like them. We don't like pregnant spays, but we have to do them. And all of us want to be the most humane, the, mo the least suffering for those fetuses. We're, we're all about population control, so we don't have a choice. So this is an extensive review of fetal physiology and pain perception. There, uh, there's a lot of papers coming up that if you want the references to, I have them. So the animal must have an adequate neural development for sensory perception and must also be in a waking conscious state. The in utero environment and the process of an ovarian hysterectomy with maternal anesthesia present and characteristics of the dog and cat fetuses prevent attainment of the adequate neural development and the sensory perception and the waking conscious state. Thus, they're precluding the fetal suffering during ovarian hysterectomy. So our patients are under general anesthesia. The fetus cannot process the anesthetics that they're getting it, that they're getting, and these drugs pass very quickly through the placenta. You can see some data down at the bottom. 
talking about consciousness in development of fetuses, it first appears um, after they're born. They have the, the level, the concept of sentience um, occurs when they take their first breath. The evidence of hi the response of hypoxia to the fetus affects their heart rate decreases, brain activity decreases. And so the evidence supports the conclusion that fetuses remain unconscious when re we're retained in the uterus after a ovary hysterectomy. Some people like, some veterinarians may elect to inject the euthanasia solution through the uterine wall or into the uterine vessels. There is no circulation, so that's not going to go anywhere, it's not going to go to the fetuses, and the fetuses don't have any circulation themselves. So they're not able to, the euthanasia solution is not going to get to them. So it's recommended that the uterus just be left opened and the fetuses undisturbed. I'm sorry, unopened. <sighs> um, the bottom line is we have to do with what, we have to do what we need to to be able to live with ourselves, to be able to sleep at night. So. We need to do what we have to do. We need to do what we're most comfortable with. Okay? Any questions on that? You don't have to leave it clamped. You, you can remove the clamps. Some people like to tie the uterus, like to tie the uterus at the base, um, at the body, because the fetuses don't come out. That's that's a, a choice. Right. They're they're still intact in, in everything, so as long as they don't touch air, um, as long as they don't take that breath, the sentience is not there. Anything else? Sorry, the question was um, leaving the uteruses, uh, any, any reason to tie off the uteruses. Some people do like to tie off the body, but that's it. Yes. So even if there's like some movement, they're not experiencing any. The fetal movement is no, there, one of these, one of these <laughs> references. Most of the like staff. The staff, here. right. Um, that is normal fetal movement. It does not indicate consciousness. Okay. And so you can just, you, you have it closed and you're just going to go ahead and bag them. Right. And you don't recommend like waiting for that to end? Dr. White's recommendation in her, in her paper was to leave them undisturbed for 20 to 30 minutes. Okay. In a high volume process, I don't know that that's always the case, always possible. Right. So um, putting, bagging them and, and taking them to the freezer is certainly an, a good option. Anything else? Any other questions? So just a few things that we use at Humane Alliance. One thing we use is corn oil for eye lube. We place these in Boston rounds with Yorker tops. They seem to stay a lot cleaner than the little tubes of eye lube of the petroleum lubricant. Um, they seem to stay cleaner. It's a good viscosity according to the ophthalmologist and you can place one or two drops. And you don't have to worry about getting that little cap back on top of the tube. Question, do you keep your bottle, I mean, I know you guys do a zillion a day, but do you keep your stock bottle of corn oil in the refrigerator or do you just keep it at room temperature? We keep it in a closet at room temperature. The, so the stock bottle of corn oil is kept in a closet at room temperature. Any other questions? Do you label it, toss it after six months, or it's just used up like it's, it, the <laughs> The question is, how long do we keep it? Um, do we toss it? They're, they're emptied every Friday and cleaned and let sit. Is there any reason why corn oil is better than another kind of oil? Corn oil, um, the ophthalmologist recommendation. Some people say, what about animals that have those corn allergies? Um, <laughs> the, <laughs> yeah, we, we get veterinarians to ask that. Um, the purpose is this is the oil of the corn, not the protein of the corn. So if an animal has a corn allergy, they're allergic to the protein of the corn. Anything else? Yes. Um, Container Store makes a really great little, like, eight mil bottle with a cap that's connected so that you don't lose your cap if you happen to travel and get bubble mm -hmm. units and stuff like that. And it lasts about a week for normal surgery, so you don't have to worry about things sitting in there for too long. Good. So the, quest, the comment was um, little for mobile units that need to travel, a little cap that has the, a lid that closes um, works well. Connected. And it's connected, and you can't lose it. <laughs> yeah, it's in the back. I'm pretty sure that when I get dispensatory contact 
Exactly. Yes. So the question was about compounding things in, in, in corn oil. Um, before Optimune came out, we compounded cyclosporin in corn oil according to the ophthalmologist's recommendation. So yeah, corn oil in the eyes has been used for 20 years. Yes. We use the corn oil in syringes, so then that way it's a small volume and Perfect. So the comment was using the, putting the corn oil in syringes instead. I like these because they sit up and that tip never has to touch anything. Anything else? Okay. Another thing we use is the space blankets. These are sometimes called emergency blankets or marathon blankets because um, they put them over marathon runners at the end of a marathon. You wouldn't know. Um, but they're, they're found very inexpensive in the camping section and they're great for wrapping animals in. Maybe the animals are a little hypothermic. They're great for wrapping animals in and keeping them toasty. These are wonderful. You can even cut them in pieces. Um, we also use, sometimes your vaccines will come in those insulated silver packets. We also use those, we call those hot pockets. And we, we wrap an animal in the space blanket and then put them down in that little insulated container and they stay nice and warm in there. Yes, in the back. How do we clean those? They, how, the answer is how do we clean those? We never touch the animal. The animal is wrapped in their own blanket, then the space blanket is wrapped outside of them. So they never touch the actual animal. Another thing we use is our baby bottle warmers. We take individual bottles of Chlorhex solution and Chlorhex scrub, and we use them and put them in baby bottle warmers. We're actually using ketchup and mustard bottles from Sam's Club now, because um, these sports bottles tended to not work well. Um, that way the animal gets an individual piece of the stack of gauze with the Chlorhex solution and the stack of gauze with the Chlorhex scrub and it's warm. Again, we're fighting hypothermia. Um, these do have to be cycled on and off and these bottles are rinsed every Friday and left open to dry over the weekend. ET tube organization. These are nothing more than PVC pipes cut with different size slits in them. These are mounted up under a bracket under a cabinet over top of the sink so that they can drain. And they're just different size slits cut for different size tubes. Sometimes people have taken um, some Velcro and put on the edges because sometimes there are little sharp edges or the tubes will fall out. So the Velcro just help, helps hold them in. Question? Yes. So the question was about cleaning ET tubes. We certainly have a, a many ways of doing that. When there's many ways of doing that, it means there's no one best way, right? Um, we put them, we soak them in our TurboShock solution, which I, is then a couple slides later. We soak them in our TurboShock solution, um, inflated. We then have bottle brushes that we scrub them out with and keep them inflated while they dry and then deflate them for hanging. Um, we tie all of our endotracheal tubes in with yarn. We prefer the cotton yarn. Um, it's very easy to tear off. You don't you need to use scissors. And we buy it undyed from the linen factory. Um, and it comes in, these, comes in these giant rolls that last for forever. The cotton yarn is really nice to tie. It's nice on their noses. And when it, it, when it gets wet on the tubes, it's very easy to come off. It doesn't get really goopy like the, the gauze we used to use. And for disinfection, we use calcium hypochlorite, which is pool chlorine at the shock levels. And the dilution is, I think, a sixteenth of a teaspoon per gallon. This is an unstable solution. So it, need, it only lasts for the day. So it needs to be poured out at the end of the day. There is a company that makes tablets of this. You can read more about some of the independent studies they've done on Parvo. It's called Wizzy Wash, W-Y-S-I, wash.com. They make metered tablets to drop into metered sprayers for kennels and shelters and things like that. We use the powder for our disinfection. And again, this is just like any other disinfectant. It's inactivated in the presence of organic substance. So the, the thing has to be cleaned first before it gets disinfected. What, what was the proportion? 
It's a, it's a sixteenth of a teaspoon per gallon, but it's tough to find sixteenth teaspoons in plastic because it will pit metal, so we actually use eighth of a teaspoon. And the place smells like a pool. It's kind of nice. I really like it, especially for people who have this bleach sensitivities or tri some people get really respiratory irritation from trifectant. So we've really liked that we've gone with. Any questions? And we get it from the pool story, but it has to be the shock concentration. That's the emphasis. It has to be that shock concentration. Yes? Does the uh, cotton yarn, does it slide on the tubes? The, the question was, does the cotton yarn slide on the tubes? No, it's actually very sturdy. It actually sticks right there. It does not slide. And it's nice on their noses, too. Get creative at feral cat housing. You want someplace quiet. You want someplace dark. You want, some, ideally, someplace with separate ventilation. We had these metal shelves built um, so that we could house a few in a small space, make sure they're covered. And we actually write on the shelves with a Sharpie who, what cat is there so that they go back in their same spot. We line the shelves with newspapers as well as those little hospital pads so that they have plenty of insulation from the metal surface. Hemostasis, we have Bushby's block, which is the nine parts lidocaine to one part epinephrine. You can also buy it um, like that for scrotal incisions of large dog castrations or any kind of bleeding. If you have a, a heavily lactating dog, sometimes those um, incisions can be really bloody sub-Q. We can put some of that. Cheats for making anyone a pack person. There are visual learners. There are, writ there are written work learners. So we have pictures of the pack. We also have a list of what goes in the pack. If you have volunteers in your clinic, you can easily make them a pack person. We have, in this, this place has individual bins and they're labeled with what, what instrument goes in those bins. Then you have a picture of the pack, you have a written description of the pack, what goes in it. You can make anybody a pack person. How about, how many people do tattoos? Yay! Easy, um, easy, easy, easy. There's no reason not to tattoo an animal as long as you have, you tell the owner you're going to do it. And easy storage is these contact lens solution containers. Um, keeps it fresh a little bit more. We use a little score with the blade that we've already used. We use the sterile indicator strip from our pack, which we've already used, and we call it our paintbrush. We dip it in a tiny bit of the tattoo paste and paint it in that incision and then glue over top. Some people don't glue. Um, we found that the animals licked it out if we don't glue them. So some people also put the tattoo paste in the incision. Not a problem. It's perfect. Yes? So you put glue along the entire length of the tattoo, not just in one or two spots? We put glue along the length of the tattoo. But our tattoos are only uh, a centimeter or so. So it's not just to put the together. It's actually, yeah. So the question was, do we, do we glue the entire tattoo? Yes, we put glue over the entire tattoo so that it covers it. Um, when we first started doing tattoos, we did not glue them, and we had little floofy white dogs that had green faces the next morning because they spent the night licking out the green tattoo paste. Um, this does come in other colors for people that like different colors. Um, the tiniest amount of tattoo paste is what you need. Are you talking ink or paste? Paste. Um, the, the tattoo paste does seem to have like a little blob effect and it m migrates everywhere. Um, keeping it in a tiny container, like these contact lens solutions work better, it works well. We use syringe caps. Um, using the tiniest piece of ta amount of tattoo paste possible. So my sterile indicator strip has barely, you need to get it up close so that you can actually see that there's tattoo paste on there. The tiniest amount of tattoo paste ever imaginable. It's glued. And you also work on, on how deep of a score. The ideal score is it doesn't bleed. You get through the dermis so that you can, you can get the tattoo paste in the dermis, but it doesn't bleed. Those postpartum animals, that's really tricky because their skin is so vascular. Somebody else? Yes. Um, do you tattoo male and dog The question was, do we tattoo male dogs? We tattoo everybody. Um, we absolutely tattoo male dogs because they are the hardest to figure out if they're, if they're neutered or not. 
We also tattoo male cats. But we put our male cat tattoo up in the area where a female cat incision would be. Because what's a, what is a neutered male cat most commonly mistaken for? A female. So if it, if we, if it misses all of our levels of checks and balances, um, if, they could, if it makes it out and they start shaving it like a cat, like a female cat, they're going to come up on that tattoo quickly. Okay? In the back. If you let the paste dry out a little bit, it's less messy. The, the, question, the statement was if you let the paste dry a little bit, it gets less messy, and that's absolutely correct. Um, that might be a, a help for you. Yeah. Like, like sit it in the cap for 24 hours and it'll get, it'll get less liquidy. Mm -hmm. More like a paste. More like a paste. Mm -hmm. right yes, in the back. We also use a 25 gauge needle for paint. Absolutely. To, to paint it? Yes, paint it. Okay, yeah. to paint it. That's a yeah. good idea. Another, another option here is to use tattoo liquid. Keep it in a 25 gauge needle. Um, I mean, keep it in a 1cc syringe with a 25 gauge needle new for each animal and inject just a teeny bit under the dermis and inject as you pull out and you just create a little bleb in there. Perfectly appropriate. As long as they're marked with something. The only thing I don't like is using black tattoo paste because those older animals get so pigmented on their belly that when they're, when they're older you can't see that tattoo for anything. So special thanks to Dr. White for her ergonomics and her fetal commentary. And these are my boys. This is my current teenager um, doing what he loves best, uh, helping the sheep go where they need to go. <laughs> and this is my boy that I lost a year ago. <laughs> this is his calendar shot. He was in two calendars. Do you have pictures of the male cat tattoo thing? We, I don't have pictures of the male cat tattoo, but it's exactly like the female. It's, it's just, a, just a little score right where you're... We do it on the belly, right where you would make, right, right where you would make a female cat spay incision. We shave a little square on the belly. We challenge our pets to shave the smallest amount of space and find the umbilicus, and that helps prevent. Right. You, the, the question was about male cat tattoos. You shave a little spot. We do want it caudal to the umbilicus. Sometimes the techs get crazy with the clippers. Um, <laughs> the assistants get crazy with the clippers, but we do want it caudal to the umbilicus because if it's cranial. I'm sorry? Ear tipping. Ear tipping. Uh, well, for ferals, absolutely. But what about owned animals that don't want ear tips? So absolutely. And the, another question we get is, do you tattoo your feral cats if you're going to ear tip them? Absolutely. Because the ear tip is a, is a beautiful, a wonderful way of identifying a spayed or neutered feral cat. But there are times when you go, is that trauma? Is that a cat fight? Is that squamous cell? So that ear, that tattoo on the belly absolutely is an absolute 100% identifier. There should not be anything permanently green on an animal. I mean, it jumps out at you. Yes? Absolutely. So the, the comment... Exactly. Yes, absolutely. So the comment was tattoos save. Tattoos save animals from exploratory surgeries or from anything. The tattoo, I wish the tattoo was mandatory nationwide for everything. Great, yes. Yay, tattoo. Absolutely. And of course, every, every veterinarian that we have come through that we train they learn how to tattoo. So some of them take them back into just regular general practice and they tattoo their animals. As long as the owner knows ahead of time, you're going to do it. And as long as the owner knows it's not a separate incision. We do get that a lot. The owner will, will complain about two incisions. Why did you do two incisions on my animal? Or this other incision is coming open. Or this other incision is green. And it's, so therefore it's infected. So be careful to let your, let your clients know that there's going to be a tattoo, and afterwards that that, that, ta that that is a tattoo and not a separate incision. Well, we, we have resorted because a lot of people will complain about the tattoos that it's relatively again. Now in our admission forms, we actually have to initial the statement that says your animal's going to receive a tattoo. Absolutely. 
So the comment was really inform the owners on the admission form when they drop it off. Your animal will get a tattoo. Ours is in bold print. Um, the comment was also on your go home instructions. Show them the tattoo, tell them about the tattoo, and have it written on the go home instructions. This is a tattoo, it's green, it's not infected, it's not a separate incision. Um, and sometimes when they, when they sign that admission form and they see that, they go, well, I don't want animal tattooed. Well, you explain to them it's this big. You won't even see it. Anything else? Yes. Do you experience any judgment or preconceived notions from your private practice environment? Absolutely. Absolutely. The thing is, Humane Alliance has been there for 23, 22 years. Um, so we do surveys to show that the, the question is, what, how do we deal with the veterinarians in our area? Um, we do surveys to show that about 90% of the people who bring an animal to us, no, 90% of the people who bring an animal to us have never been to a vet. 90% of the animals who have been to, who bring to us have never been to a vet. Um, we get a lot of rabies vaccinations. So A, we're not taking theirs. Um, B, we're not doing anything but spay neuter. We don't have any heartworm preventative. We don't have flea stuff. And if you do, I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm just saying we don't. We don't have any heartworm preventative. We don't have any flea. Um, medications, we don't have, we don't treat ear infections, we don't have anything. The only thing we do outside of spay neuter is repair umbilical, open umbilical hernias. That's it. Any other questions? The question is do we do means testing, um, in income levels, things like that. We don't. We certainly work with a lot of groups. Um, the majority of our so the majority of our animals come on our transport program, and those are come from groups in the area. We work with about 35 different groups in 23 counties. So if that group wants to income test the people that come to them, then they can do that. We we work with the group. The group decides. Yes. Do you do the transporting? We do the transporting. We transport every day. We put 60,000 miles a year on a truck. A truck lasts us about three years. What's the program? Two hours. We keep them all overnight. They return the next day. Except for Fridays, we only we don't do any transport. We only do our local animals, um, and we re we usually are done with surgery by noon. We release them at four, and it's a very small number, like thirty or so. And is there anybody there all night watching the animals? There is no. The question was, is there anybody overnight watching? There there is no one overnight watching, and we have that posted in the lobby. If an owner chooses to take their animal home, do you let them? Um, the question was if. If an owner chooses to take the animal home, do we let them? Um, if the animal is showing extreme anxiety, if the animal is showing extreme aggression, um, we do try to do those early and get the animal to come pick them up. If the animal was declined for surgery because of an extreme medical issue, we have the, the, the owners come get them and pick them up. Um, if they want to, they don't get to because they want to. Um, so that they stay clean, warm, and dry, and confined, because they're likely to be tossed out in the field the next day. We're we're very Western North Carolina is a very rural area. Asheville is a little shelter. Asheville is like a little haven in the middle of a very large Southern Appalachia region. So, if there's any more any questions, there are six of us here from Humane Alliance this weekend who are veterinarians and two technicians. Grab us, ask any question you want to. We also have extensive issue information on our website. Everything's under the e-learning tab. That's the one thing that I wish I could fix. Everything's under the e-learning tab. If you go under that e-learning tab and start clicking on things, there's a wealth of information. We have our, pro our drug protocols on there. We have all of our forms and paperwork on there. Um, everything's on there. We also have a YouTube channel where we have about 200 videos. Everything from cutesy, my cat will never go outside, um, and PSAs to how to place a tattoo, how to shave an animal, how to prep a cat, how to clean a cage. Um, we also have whentospay.org, which is a general public information website about spaying. Please check it. If your clinic is not listed as one of the clinics there, please click on the my clinic is not listed on this website link so that your clinic can get on there. 
Anything else? Any questions? 